Stuart Swerdlow is a psychic and medical intuitive with a unique background. His family was instrumental in the founding of the Soviet Union, and his great-uncle Yakov was its first president. Even so, his father came to America and joined the U.S. military. Stuart himself had a difficult childhood, where he endured various painful medical experiments and was later brought into the famous Montauk program. Perhaps because of that childhood and his own special psychic skills, he had a strong mental toughness. He was one of the very few participants in that program who emerged with all his memories intact. What he learned at Montauk and through his ET connections is frankly mind-blowing. This is some of the deepest and most interesting material on the big picture of humanity, which is available anywhere. The video is an excerpt from a fascinating interview done by Jimmy Church on February 10, 2015, for his popular radio show, Fade to Black. If you have limited time and want to hear Stewart explain his cosmology, skip to 30 minutes to hear a description of our solar system's strange history and the origin of human life on planet Earth. And there is more in Mr. Swerdlow's books and on his website, expansions.com. But if you can spare the time, I recommend listening to the whole thing. Fasten your seatbelt and get ready for a mind-blowing hour or so. It's all going to be okay. I'll never let anything else mm-hmm. happen yes, to you. Yes, right. Is right. that is that what happened? Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, that's what the programmers would do because they would bring you to the brink of death or to the brink of the most severe fear that you could ever imagine. And then they would rescue you from that at the last moment. And then it was kind of a bait and switch because they became God. That's the God that saved you, not the one in heaven or the religious one that you may have known or heard about, but this person who is your God. And is that, did it work? Yes, because uh, whenever I would see that person, I knew, oh, yes, no matter what happens, he'll save me. Wow. Wow. And how do you deal with that as an adult? (laughs) You know? (laughs) Well, I'll tell you, uh, you don't trust anybody. I don't trust anyone anymore. Right. Um, (laughs) Oh, man. Because uh, when you watch it, when you watch it the way that, look, Chris didn't hold back in the film. No. And he wanted to make sure that uh, uh, it, it almost could be X-rated. Not X-rated because of the sex, but I mean X-rated because of the content. It is over-the-top truth-telling. And uh, the way that he portrays it in the film, you are right there. And when that guy comes in the room... Uh, well, at that point, it's uh, uh, the actor that plays. Um, uh, help me, help me! I'm brain freezing. Uh, which, which uh, the director of the project. Oh, uh, uh, Pruitt. Yeah, Jack Pruitt. Yeah. So Jack Pruitt comes in the room. Was it Jack Pruitt that came in to you, uh, or was it just uh, another handler? It. You know, he was a very aloof, and I I can hardly even remember seeing him. It was very, very distant. He did not uh, mingle with uh, us lowly uh, Montauk boys. Um, but uh, he was, uh, you know, um, he was like Nero playing the violin while Rome burned. Right, you know? right. He, he was like that. Uh, have you had any contact with Jack Pruitt uh, no. since Montauk? No, 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 no. Uh, have you tried to reach out to him? Oh, no. why would I? Well, that's my question. Yeah. <laughs> No. So, uh, and what about? Uh, Although I have, I had uh, contact with my programmer. You have. He's dead. Long time now, but I had contact with him in the early nineties. Did he come to you, or did you find him? I found him through a government uh, agent. And how did that go? Actually, he was quite kind to me. After. Were you angry? Um. Yes and no. 
um, I, I learned a lot from him. Um, I know that he trained other well-known people whom I helped subsequently. And um, I think he just, you know, he was the Eastern European. And so he, uh, to him, it was just his work. His job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how did you hold, I mean, did, did, you must have had a wave of anger that you were controlling. I, I don't know how you held back. And, of course, you must have asked the question, you know, why me? Why did you do this to me? Did, did you go there? Well, I already know the answer to that. I mean, I knew about my family history. I knew about the alien genetics. Uh, I knew that I couldn't be, uh, my mind, my memories couldn't be masked. So I was an anomaly, and I was told so. And um, plus, you know, there, there was a time when the government put me in federal prison for that. That's right. And that is when I met the programmer, so there was not much I could do about it. Interesting, interesting. It seems like it was almost ongoing. You know, when yeah. does the nightmare end? When No, because they still trained me while I was in the prison. Exactly, exactly. Uh, let's let's back up uh, uh, a step here. So with uh, you, you had the mind control aspects and we had the time travel. I want to visit the time travel here in just a bit. But uh, with, with the mind control program, were you sent on a mission? And and did it involve, you know, a possible assassination plot? What did it What did it involve, and what did they intend to use you for? Well, I think that the people who have read my books would know that, Jimmy, <laughs> With, because they sent me to the time of Christ. Right. And in fact, that is actually depicted in the film. Uh, in, a, in a kind of a sideways kind of uh, way, if you remember that. Yes. Uh, and, it, and it wasn't exactly like that. Um, I don't know if you want me to go into that or not. Well, we can. Well, let's do the, I, I consider that the, the, the time travel aspect uh, mm -hmm. of it. Uh, what I'm referring, what I'm trying to get to is, if you know, did they ever uh, send you out on a uh, on a mission? Uh, was there anything intentional done, or would you even remember it if uh, yeah, yeah. if they did? Yes, I wrote about them. Yes. Okay. What well, can you share one with us? Well, do you want me to go to the one? Uh, well, we, the film? well, yes. Well, we yeah, we can do that. Sure, sure. Um, and well, my question with that actually, and I'm going to let you uh, go ahead and tell the story, but uh, I'm going to jump ahead. Was it was it like a DNA test? <laughs> was it, oh. what was, you know what 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 was the intention of it? I, I, well, you you kind of right. I mean, it didn't involve the DNA. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll let you run with it. Go ahead. Well, and I know it's going to sound odd to the listeners who have not heard this story, but it, ha it happened twice um, in Montauk. Uh, they had alien technology. And they learned that if that every point in time and space has a unique set of vibration and coordinate, and if you know the set of coordinates and vibration to where you want to go, and you match that with a person, place, or thing, there is an instant connection. Then there's that's how time travel and space travel uh, can occur. And so uh, they uh, had the coordinates for the time of Christ. Because the aliens uh, had told them and actually gave them a crystalline type, uh, well, it looks like a pencil, but it's crystal. And there was a film or a video of uh, Christ, the crucifixion. And it explained that he wasn't really crucified, it was a staged event. And that's a whole nother story. And uh, In fact, uh, in my new book, True World History, I've written about that. But the people at Montauk wanted to send a team back to assassinate him so that, in effect, uh, Christianity would not exist in the current time the way it exists now. And so they sent me back with a, a pistol, and I was supposed to find Christ in Jerusalem and shoot him. And then they said they would bring me back. And so I got to where 
they told me he was, and there were these huge, uh, I guess, stone or mar marble white steps going up to what looked like a very big Roman-type-looking building. And the Christ figure came out and stood on the top, and I looked at him, and he looked at me, and I raised the gun, and I couldn't do it, and I ran away. And they brought me back. What did he look like, Stuart? He was about five foot ten, uh, auburn hair, uh, green eyes. I would say kind of a, a light tan skin, uh, thin but well built. Did you know who he was right oh, away? Yeah. Oh yes, I know who it was. Any communication? No, he just looked at me, and I, looked, I thought, okay, I should not be doing this. <laughs> and you ran away. And I ran, uh, I ran. How old were you? Oh, I must have been 15, 16. Lesson learned? Well, they sent me back. Right. Uh, because I was punished for and, that. And what happened? And so then they sent me back, and they said, this time we're going to send you to while he's on the cross. We need his blood because we're going to clone him. And so they sent me back with this little vial. And if any of you know people who unfortunately have uh, diabetes and need to take uh, their blood test, you know, like this, it was like that. Right, kind right. Of, little tiny. And he was on the cross, and I went up to him. And he had, no, of course, no shoes or anything on. And I jabbed his toe and took the blood sample. Was he still alive? Yes, he was alive for many years after that. Did he? Oh, 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 okay. Let's come back to that. Did he see you when you yes. came up to the cross? Yes. And did he recognize you? Yes. Do, do you think that he recognized I you? I know he did. And did you look into his eyes? I tried not to. But I you did? At his feet. Okay. And I just did it and left. You did it and left. Mission accomplished. Uh, how did Because you... I figured, okay, it's just a drop of blood. I didn't really, I mean, it's not a cross, okay? I didn't really hurt him. Right. And by the way, the way it's depicted is not the way it really was. <laughs> Great minds think alike, Stuart. You knew what I was going to ask. Okay. I'm, re so... <laughs> I'm reading your mind, and quite frankly, it's scary, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So who was there at the cross when you went up? Were you alone? I was alone. There were people around. It was kind of like um, a raised field, if you will, or mountain. There were many other crosses with people on it. And there was like a rock border, uh, almost like the, like the kind you put around the garden almost. And people were behind those rocks, praying on their knees, crying, uh, sleeping. It was kind of like early, early morning. And so I just went up there. Because people, you could go up there. So nobody, yeah. nobody stopped you. No, no. Now, I have to ask you this though: uh, What were you dressed in? Did they period dress you, or yes. were you wearing nineteen yes. seventies bell no. bottoms? No, no, no. They they dress you in appropriate clothing to where you're going. Okay. As long as they know where you're going, because some people wound up in other places, and that was not pretty. What about now? You speak ten languages, but do you speak <laughs> yeah. Aramaic? I spoke Hebrew. You spoke Hebrew. Yeah, even though in those days they, the, 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 the people, the population spoke Aramaic, but in the religious uh, temples they spoke Hebrew. How did you know, uh, if you don't mind me asking, I just this is two guys talking. I, this is a guy question. How did you know where you were going? Oh, they, or, oh, did they, you, or did they deposit you close to the cross and you yeah. knew where you were at? They know. They knew all the coordinates. They knew where everything was. Remember, they got a lot of information from alien records, if you will. Right. That documented all of this. And how did you? How did you appear uh, without you know freaking everybody out? You know, I, I would just wind, I would go through this mirror-like uh, contraption. Better lack a better term. Uh -huh. and once I went through, I was just on the street there, or or someplace else. You know, I was just like a normal scene. And nobody was surprised, or do you think you just kind of dissolved, faded into the scene? You know, nobody said, "Hey, look, someone just appeared." I mean, it just I was just there, right? And no one paid attention. You could have maybe absorbed into somebody else's body that was already standing there. 
No, this was actually a physical transmission. So you definitely knew it was you. I mean, like you could look at your hands and Mm -hmm. say, okay, this is me. Yes. But you were able to speak Hebrew. Um, Did anybody, did did you talk to anybody? Did you go up to anybody? or? When we go, or I should say when we did go on these missions, one of the um, rules is you don't speak unless absolutely necessary. Exactly. So no communication. You were cool. Um, uh, and you, uh, how close, um, I guess what, man, I'm just going to talk to you like you're, you're, you're sitting right here. What was the cross right in front of you? And, and how much time did you spend, uh, uh, walking up? How long were you there? Seconds. Seconds. And then um, after, how, how did you, how did they know the mission was complete in order to draw you back uh, uh, to present time? They have the ability to watch the scene as it happens. And how was that? Was it? Uh, that's some kind of alien technology again, where you can tune into the frequency of the specific point in time and space. Interesting. And observe it. So when you got back, now you've uh, you've completed the mission. You've got your syringe or vial or that was it, a vial. Yeah, yeah uh, the sample of blood. What happened next? Well, then they sent me to the surface of Mars to hand it over to one of the psychics from the Montauk Project to be used in the cloning process. Uh, that that was instantaneous, like the same day, the same moment. It was very shortly thereafter. Right, right. And what? And so what did they do? Were, were you able to see what they were doing with the blood, or no, did you just no. come back to Earth? and? Yeah, yeah. I met the person on the surface, which, by the way, Mars is not, not like what they tell you it is. Right. And uh, there's an underground area, uh, and there's many different civilizations that have a piece of uh, Mars, by the way. And uh, they cloned a Christ there. And they are using that body for a staged second coming. Interesting. Last night we had uh, uh, Dr. Angela Smith um, on the show. She's a remote viewer. Mm -hmm. And she, in one of her projects, and I can talk about this because she was on the show last night and shared this with us. She said that uh, she remote viewed Mars, Mm -hmm. uh, went to Mars, and she encountered an uh, an ET species that was there, and that lived underground. And she described them as a, a, a different shade of gray, but a gray race or species. Is that what you experienced? Did you see anything like that? Uh, uh, there are several uh, civilization. Well, I shouldn't say civilizations. Bases different uh, civilizations uh, in Mars. So it, it, there's more than one. Yep. She said everything was underground, and she mm-hmm. said that she did uh, talk to them about some of the anomalies that have been showing up in images here on, you know, from different probes that were sent mm-hmm. to Mars. And yep. one of the comments that she made, I'm just wondering if you've heard anything about this or experienced this. She said that uh, the probes that we were sending to Mars, I'm not making this up, that they thought that they were gifts. <laughs> they literally would go out and gather them and bring them underground and uh, that they thought that they were gifts, that they didn't know that they were probes. Uh, sound, did you experience or see anything or hear anything like that? No, uh, the beings that are there know what the heck they're doing. Okay. And they consider humans to be very low level. Really? Oh, yeah. In what respect? Um, well, they it, can refer to humans as containers. Like tools? Con- like containers to be filled up and emptied out as needed. For what purpose? Wow, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. What purpose? Huh. Huh. Okay, back to Montauk. Now, with uh, uh, with uh, everybody that was there, especially, you know, Al and Preston uh, in the film, do you remember Al and Preston being there when you were there? I, I, again, I have to tell you, I was a child. Right. 
And so I knew by visual sight these people, who they were at the time, I didn't know. I just knew that they were above me. The inter- one of the interesting things uh, uh, with Al and Preston and yourself uh, and you guys sharing these experiences, all of them are nearly identical. Uh, the description of Montauk, uh, the chair, the room, the computers, uh, mm-hmm. the way that everything worked. Um, did, did no contact with anybody uh, uh, before, not only before the film, but let's say before the 1990s, um, because all of these, ev- all the experiences are the same, and they're frightening because of the level of detail that's involved, not only from you, but from Al and from Preston. Um, uh, uh, again, the, 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 the truth is always in the details and everything is identical. Um, how do you, well, you explain it because you can explain it away because it's, it all happened, but also nobody ever communicated with each other and you guys never actually have met in real life. Oh yes. I've met them. Well, I know. I don't mean, I, I mean, during the experiences. Oh, during the experiences, I know, because remember, we were not allowed to have relationships with anyone. We were not allowed to have any emotional uh, ties or contacts because you had to be detached. You know, they were children you would see one day and next day they were gone because they were dead. Right. So you were, you were not encouraged to have any, any kind of interaction unless you were commanded to. Any clues as to where the bodies are? Do you have any well, idea? I know I, you've been asked that, but and I mentioned I talk about it in the film, right? And uh, so, you know, I had nothing to do with the disposal of those bodies, but I had been told that some of them were placed in an underground area, and uh, lime was thrown on them to decompose them, so nothing would be left. Uh, I was also told some were just dumped in the ocean. And I was also told some were just burned. One of the things that uh, I, I look at with with Montauk, it's kind of the more frightening aspect of it. it it's all bad, but uh, mm-hmm. when you're or experimenting with time travel and transporting bodies, and mm-hmm. somebody's got to be the guinea pig, and somebody's yeah. probably not coming back, and Correct. somebody is stuck in the past or the future. Mm-hmm. Or on another planet. That's right. Uh, do you think a lot of that went on? I know that it did, yeah. Uh, did you, I know that there wasn't any contact, uh, or not a lot of contact, with, but did you have a relationship, or did you know anybody, like, personally, get that didn't come back? I saw people not come back. I didn't know them personally. How did, uh, how did the crew you know, Preston Nichols and crew, how, how were they dealing with that? Did they care? You would have to ask them that question. You, you know what I mean? Was it totally a disconnect? You know, I, I knew Al, you know, a number of years before he died. And uh, he was very detached. He was a very unemotional, detached person. So I can see where this was just a job. And, uh, you know, uh, he just did what he thought he had to do and uh, Preston uh, is you know a very different kind of personality Um, I I don't think he's overly emotional about anything either but really they should well of course Al is no longer here but uh, Preston can answer that for himself where how do you how do you think where do morals go you know where where how does somebody get so changed? I understand it's your job, but you still have moral decisions as a human being. Mm-hmm. Where do the morals go? We were indoctrinated pretty much all, every time we were there, and we were told that humanity was incapable of taking care of itself or uh, monitoring itself, and so the work that we were doing was actually helping mankind to survive. And so sometimes you have to do things which are uh, difficult in order to succeed in the end goal. And that's what we were told. Is there any one ET race, uh, Stuart, that is okay with humanity? You know, that 
a benevolent that may be our friends? You know, I get asked that so many, and it uh, offends, apparently, all the New Age people who think the aliens are love, light, and peace when they are far from it. Right. I can only tell you that the really, truly benevolent ones are not here, because they don't interfere. The ones who are here have an agenda. And we're going to get into that agenda now. Let's, uh, let's change gears. This is Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network, the spoke radio for the masses. We are speaking with Stuart Swerdlow. I'm um, your host, Jimmy Church. Okay, let's, let's change gears and let's go right there. What is the agenda? And before you answer that, is that agenda tied directly into uh the nazis and paperclip and what was going on at montauk is that part of the agenda and were they holding hands or are we talking about two different things well uh, jimmy uh it's thousands of different things because the the universe our galaxy alone is teeming with civilizations see and the earth by analogy is the Afghanistan of our galaxy. How so? How so? Because we are considered to be a dangerous, volatile, uh, insecure, immature group that needs to be contained before they do bad things elsewhere. And, okay, okay. Did I cut you off? If I... No, and we already have. Because even back in 1993... Uh, ten years after Montauk ended, there was a U.S. general, and I don't remember his name, who said, we already can go to the stars. We already are going places. See, So we are a tremendous threat. Ima- imagine if ISIS and Al-Qaeda had a huge air force. Right. See, so what would the rest of the world do? See, so... That, that's the Earth. The Earth is considered ISIS, and all the ones out there say, you know, we got to stop these people because they're not, they're not right. And so, but, but there's many agendas because there are um, those who want to use the resources here. There are those who want to make humans into slaves. There are those who want to install their own empire on the Earth. There are those who want to just colonize. I mean, you pick the group, and there's an agenda. I can't tell you there's only one. Is, uh, does this reach back as far as the Anunnaki? Are we going back 400,000 years? No, we're going back millions of years because this Earth was created. Uh, it was terraformed. It didn't have uh, the ability for surface life before aliens came here. And, okay, so where, uh, when you say that there's thousands of agendas, and I understand exactly where you're going with all of that, are they directly influencing, let's say, Washington, D.C. and Moscow uh, and, and, and the, the things that we are seeing unfold in front of us? Is that not, is that our DNA that is doing that or is that another DNA and force that is uh, causing world events? Humans are also aliens here. So our DNA is hybrid. It's not pure anything. See? So to answer your question is yes, uh, but uh, many of these groups consider humans to be part of them because we have those genetics. I can tell you the original, and this is in my books, people know about it, The original group here were reptilians, see? And the human beings are a mixture of reptilian and mammalian because there was a synthesis going on. That's why it says in the Bible, let us make man in our image. There's no singular God. It's a plural. It's not God. It's, It's a group of beings, see? And that may offend religious people, but the Bible is not to be taken literally. Well, when you don't say my and you say us and our, mm-hmm. that's a and, yes. And I, I will tell you that in the Old Testament, every, without exception, reference to God is plural. Do the aliens, I'm sorry, I was sipping my Starbucks. 
Uh, it was so That's bad. That's full of poison, you know. Yeah, it's so bad to do. I know it. It's so bad. Do you drink coffee? You don't drink coffee? I drink organic black coffee. Okay. Well, so you do your caffeine injection then. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I apologize for doing that. Um, drinking on the air. Very unprofessional. Well, I'll try, I'll try to get over it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, um, now, uh, 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 your ability uh, to read DNA, okay, uh, what, what exactly does that mean? I want to lead that into uh, where we are today. Okay, so we're, we're, we're away from the aliens now. Well, no, are, are we? Well, no, no, because the I was explaining about the aliens, and then we went into what I do. So, well, I just don't, I just want to give you the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, and where I'm going with that is uh, our DNA today mm-hmm. is. Uh, 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 well, I'm going to let you answer that question, but it was manipulated, mm-hmm. you know, millennia ago. Many. Yeah. Uh, that's right. Uh, uh, and and we haven't really, th- our, our actions today uh, as a human race, war, for one, um, and anger at our brothers uh, constantly uh, mm-hmm. and our neighbors, mm-hmm. it seems to be predetermined. And that's where I'm going with that. And, okay. Okay. And- and that's because, and I want to go back to uh, what I was originally stating, the, the this planet, I, I mean, I could go back very far, but it, we don't have enough time and it could be confusing, but I, I will just say that there, there were colonists here uh, before the reptilians, and these colonists were uh, insectoid, if you will. They were in the inner Earth, and this was a water planet. Now, there were colonies on Mars, human colonies, and on a planet that no longer exists, that was between Mars and Jupiter, uh, that was called Maldek. Make a long story short, the uh, reptilians uh, sent an ice comet in, uh, kind of flipped Neptune on its axis, uh, pull the atmosphere off of Mars, cause those people to go inside the planet, exploded Maldek, which is why we have an asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. And then the ice comet kind of went into a revolving swirl with the Earth, which was in the second position from the sun, and pushed the Earth into the third position to the sun, polarized the oceans and created ice caps. And the ice uh, pla- a comet became Venus, and when the came close to the sun, uh, the light of the sun caused the ice to evaporate and create the cloud cover that's still around Venus. And so the reptilians then drove a vehicle into the solar system and parked it around the Earth. We now know that as the moon. And from the moon, they colonized the largest continent that appeared above the water, uh, which uh, has become known as Lemuria. And it was only uh, hundreds of thousands of years later that hu- human or mammalian life came to the Earth. So from the reptilian perspective, they were here first. This is their planet. Humans are the invaders, you see. Now, going back to the very beginning of our conversation tonight, you had your experiences with uh, uh, E.T. before you were 13 years old. You uh-huh. have contact now as an adult. Is that where this information is coming from? No. Where, where, where is the information coming from? <laughs> I'm, the information I just gave you is what we learned at Montauk Project through over a decade of researching linear history on this planet, plus information that was given through various other uh, alien sources, plus information through artifact and uh, remnants of ancient civilizations that were discovered that are not revealed to the public. With, uh, with the, the way the Bible uh, has portrayed the devil and the way that the devil looks and Satan looks and or certainly how he's classically portrayed. Is that a, a reptilian race? Yes. Is that what hell is? 
Uh, am well, I asking the question right? Am I making yes, sense? Yes, but I have to give a longer answer. Okay. And 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 so when when the humans who who actually human civilization uh, the orig origin is the Lyrian star system that was attacked by a Draco reptilian and that's why the humans fanned out through various parts of the galaxy Mars being one of them Maldek being another and then uh, when the Earth became colonizable even though the reptilians were here. Uh, the humans came to the, the next largest continent, which we now uh, or now call Atlantis, and uh, they colonized that. And, and of course, humans or mammalians and reptilians should not be living together in the same spot. So there was war, and uh, it was very destructive, and they decided to make a peace treaty by creating the synthesis of the mammalian and reptilian, which is what we are now. Uh, mankind is the synthesis. That's why we have reptilian brainstem, we have skin that wrinkles and peels, we have a reptilian lymphatic system, and on and on. Human body is the representation of reptilian life. Do we start off reptilian in yes. the womb? Yes, and you know, when you watch how a baby, a fetus gestates in the womb, the first six weeks, it's the androgynous reptilian, because that's the foundation of the DNA. And so the change actually happens in the womb. It has mm -hmm. has have there uh, ever been reptilians born where that change hasn't necessarily taken place? Yes, yes. Because if uh, by some mix of genetics there's a fifty fifty split of uh, mammalian and reptilian, then uh, it depends on what type of soul personality enters the body that will determine the physical manifestation of the DNA. Yeah, wow. And would they, if they were born here, or the change didn't take place, I should say, yeah. do they go underground? Well, usually when you have a, such a high percentage like that, that's kind of an elite group, and they don't really make themselves that public. Would you be able to recognize a reptilian if you saw one? I have, yes. Now you have to understand two different things. There are those who can shape shift between human and reptilian. Right. And there are reptilians who cannot shape shift but use holographic images around themselves to look human. And you could recognize one? Or yes. could could I? I I should that's, anyone, that's I know one, yes can be trained to see this yes of course and and how would i go about that well you'd have to open up you have to open up your mind pattern and your and your ability um do the hyperspace work that i teach uh, open up your genetic codes uh you can do this and i do want to remind everybody let me uh, d just do this really quick you can go to expansions.com uh, Stuart's website, uh, through, you can go directly. It's expansions.com. Also, over at jimmychurchradio.com, all of the links are there. You can click on Stuart, click on his name. And, uh, of course, we have a Stuart page there, too, as well. And and everything is there. I got an email. Uh, uh, this is kind of seg it's a complete right turn, but I don't want to let this get away from us. What do you think of the recent uh, the reasons for the recent rise of Christianity in Russia? Yes, uh, that is also staged, because what's being planned is the New World Religion, with this uh, staged uh, Second Coming of Christ. And uh, you see, what's going on now is a battle between the major Illuminati families for global control, and now that they feel it's within their grasp, they're all fighting with each other uh, to be on top. What? Well, I, I want to ask you about that. Uh, the, when it comes to the Illuminati and the, uh, the 13 families, uh, and when I bring guests on the show and we talk about this, we all, it, it, the Illuminati is there. I don't think any of us are going to dispute that fact. And there's definitely control going on, and there's people pulling puppet strings. We get that. Um, what, can you name any of the, uh, of, the, of the 13? I mean, is the Rothschilds, is that yeah, one I mean, obvious? I, I, they're all listed in my Blue Blood book. It's right there. The whole list is there. Um, so people can go read my Blue Blood, True Blood book. Um, 
But remember, there's a lot of intermarriage be- below, or I should say associated with the 13 families, is the Committee of 300, which are 300 of families who work in close association with them. But what we also need to remember is there's a 14th family, which is the royal family of Japan, uh, which uh, the other 13 are trying to destroy. And what's the, what's the goal of the Illuminati? Is it money? Global domination. Yeah, is it, control. Does, yeah, does it come down to money? Is that what it is? Well, they have all the money. They, you know, they have the money. They create the money. It's a question of power. And ultimately, what they would like to do is create a new galactic empire using the Earth as its headquarters. Does it? Does the Illuminati go beyond uh, the Middle Ages? Are we talking about? Going back to Egypt and 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 before mm-hmm. goes back to Sumer. It goes back to Sumer. Yeah. And uh, uh, it, it it my my view is this: it has to. The Illuminati is, isn't some new thing from Bavaria in the seventeen oh, hundreds. No. no, in 1776, Adam Weishaupt uh, created the Illuminati, and that was the first time it became public. That's when the the secret part of it started to become public. That's that's what his role was. You know, somebody just uh, uh, this is from Michael Anderson, and I find this very interesting. And I'd love your comment on this. When, uh, as far as the reptilians go, was it ever really discussed openly before, say, nineteen eighty, nineteen ninety? Was there? Uh, well, by anybody, was there ever any references to it besides, obviously, the Bible? I think the Bible is strongly there. There were and there are groups on the earth who were quite aware of the reptilian presence. But, uh, of course, you know, in those days, even now, it's very difficult to discuss that publicly. What And what do we do as a, uh, as a human race? Uh, and, and how do you teach uh, yeah. to do mm-hmm. these changes? Yes, yes. Uh, so I teach work that, uh, first of all, DNA opening exercises. I teach balancing the left and right hemisphere of the brain, opening the pineal gland, deprogramming from the Illuminati mind control that's pervasive globally. I do techniques on that. Uh, release work of mind patterns that are not serving, growing up the child within, connecting to the oversoul and God mind. I have a lot of work. Uh, that I teach, and uh, now is the, I mean, there's no time to waste. Everybody needs to be doing this. You want to take some phone calls? Sure. Sure, absolutely. Let's do it. Let's open up the phone lines, 323-825-5045, 323-825-5045. You can also Skype in, of course, uh, Fade to Black 14. Fade to Black 14, that's the number 14, 323-825-5045. We're on a time delay, about 10 seconds, Stuart, so we'll wait uh, wait for the uh, phone calls to come in. How do you, um, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, but when you go through so much uh, drama, I, I want to use the word horror because it, it, it was truly that, how do you find yourself dealing with that every day? Do you ever get past it? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, the imprint is there. You know, it's, uh, I, I always like to use analogies. When you, when you have a very deep scar, even when, the, when it closes up and heals, there's still a scar there. You know, it reminds you of it. And so, yes, every day I have to remember where I came from and that I survived things that most people should not survive. Uh, so, therefore, whatever I experience now is really easy. And uh, I can surpass anything. Do, do, are you a funny guy? Do, do, are you able to have humor? I have been told I'm hilarious. <laughs> you know, I mean, it just seems, I, I don't know how you can not come out of it, mm. you know, somewhat damaged isn't the right word, but it, it's something that, it's a mountain to overcome that is just huge. Yes, and you know, it, it is humor that actually helped me survive. Because if I didn't see the funny side of everything, I wouldn't be here now. Oh, I meant to ask you this earlier um, while we're waiting for the uh, calls to start coming in. Have you ever um, 
seen objects in the sky? Have you ever had a uh, an actual UFO sighting? Oh, that, sure. That yeah. that wasn't part of uh, uh, everything else. Well, <laughs> you know, it is. Everything's part of everything. Well, else. yeah, certainly, certainly. But, uh, but uh, yes, of course, I have seen those things. Yeah, tell tell me about it. What, what have you seen? Well, the the most. Well, gosh, uh, one time, actually, uh, I, my family went to a, a restaurant in Montauk, and we had family uh, guests from England, and we were driving back to our home, and uh, I, from the back of the car, I could see a, a light coming off the ocean, and it followed the car all the way home, and when we got out, it was just hovering over the treetops, and uh, I actually ran over to it, and it flew away. How big was it? What, oh, what did it, it look a, like? About the size of a station wagon, I would I would say, uh, in those days. Um, then another time, the weirdest place was Australia, because uh, I was there in the outback, and I was staying with some friends, and they're very, very clear skies because there's no pollution out there. And every night you would stand outside and look up, and it was like uh, like a UFO freeway. I mean, every minute there was something flying by, zipping by, stopping, zooming. I'd never seen anything like it. Interesting. Uh, any cameras? Did you take it, any cameras, any pictures? No, I didn't, actually. Isn't that, isn't that strange, even with my own experiences that I've seen? No cameras. You know, yeah, it's funny because it always happens when you don't have the camera. It, it is. Well, you know what, though? I, I had a cell phone with me. What, this one experiment didn't didn't even think about, yeah. and twenty minutes went by as we were watching this with a group of friends, and yeah. uh, nobody, nobody, there was a bunch of guys out. Nobody took any pictures. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, really funny how that works. All right, let's uh, let's start grabbing some phone calls. Hang on, let me uh, hit a button or two. Okay, hi, you live on Fade to Black. Say hi to Stuart Swerdlow. Hi, Stuart. I I waited a while to call in. Uh, it's very obvious from our, our tweet deck here that a lot of people, you've covered a lot of ground. And I was trying to think what I could ask you because I, I don't have a lot to hang a peg of or anything on. So I would like to ask you, um, and you know, you're just a horrendous life you've had. I mean, this is to be afraid so much of the time. I, I just, I commend you for your bravery. But I guess I want to ask you about Montac itself. If I had not seen... Uh, the pre-screening of the film, uh, again, I wouldn't have anything to, to hold on to. I need a point of reference. So I wanted to ask you a few things about that. For example, how much of this that you have experienced, I mean, you're telling me about what you think the agenda was for all these people, but for you to go through it, you say you were not beaten, you were given drugs, uh, were you, uh, you know, and were there any females? I don't hear about any girls being abducted. Yes. Yes, actually, I was beaten. I don't know if I made that clear. I was horrendously beaten, uh, both uh, by hand and by object. Uh, so that did happen. Broken Free bones? Uh, I fractured some things, yes. Um, you mentioned no females. Correct. When there is mind control and programming, you know, male and female have different energies. Male energy projects out. Female energy absorbs in. So if they try to work uh, with a female, the female will absorb the energy and distort the uh, programming. So when you work with male with male, it enhances and boosts the programming, and that's why they work mostly with males. Females were used in, in sexual magic ritual and in breeding experiments. Well, that's what I wanted to get into because I have met people, uh, women who are on the street uh, or women who are heavily involved in the sex industry, uh -huh. and I have read things about them possibly being programmed to to just uh -huh. that sexuality is not a big thing for them. It's a, right. a kind of a service or a spiritual thing. And, and, and you know, when Anton LaVey was in the Bay Area practicing things, I got the feeling that that a lot of the people that were attracted to him were attracted to that kind of energy. Uh, and they say that a lot of these women that uh, are ended up using to service, uh, you know, people high in the power structure, high up the pyramid. Yes, that's correct. And you, you're correct that the, the sex in the, in the ritual 
is, has nothing to do with desire. It has to do with an energetic formula. So a that, power exchange. Yes, yes, and sometimes uh, actually a power booster for a particular event or, or, or time period. Um, there's many different reasons or formulas that they can use. Well, it, it's also amazing. Now, were you drugged? I mean, I, I came up in an era when there was a lot of psychedelics being introduced into Western culture. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that there was a heavy use of these? For example, like uh, uh, like the gentleman that wrote about it, uh, Ken Kesey, you know, said that he was used for psychedelic uh, LSD experiments. Yes, yes, they used a lot of that. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, well, you Dino. Seem, you seem very grounded, and uh, I, I have a lot more to ask. We're going to have to have you on again so we can pick your uh, experiences apart some more. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate you. Thank Thanks you. for being here. Thank you, Dino. Um, you know, and he actually raises another question that I meant to uh, get into earlier, which is, is there uh, religion when it comes to E.T.? A very good question, uh, Jimmy. You have, you have very good questions tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. You must have taken a question class. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, yes, uh, many of them uh, have a, uh, well, let's say, spiritual uh, belief system rather than uh, religious. They don't believe in a religion as we believe in uh, on Earth. They believe that uh, God is everything and in everything, and that there is no need to do uh, worship because it's already in you. Interesting. And do they look at a creator? Do they have a creator? And yeah, well, to them, the entire, the, the, all all of existence is the creator. In other words, all that is, uh, all the universe, not just this universe, but all. The uh, parallel universe is the infinite ones, uh, all part of the same, yeah. And what about, uh, and we talked about this a little bit, and what about, you know, Jesus and Christianity? Mm -hmm. uh, where did they, was any of that revealed? Yes, uh, they claim, what, well, there are three groups uh, in conjunction that uh, claim that they created him uh, in order to steer humanity in a certain direction. Do you feel that E.T., or when I say E.T., I'm using that in the broadest sense of a stroke of a pen. Uh, were they uh, honest, you know, telling the truth? Uh, uh, mostly not. Uh, and when I say that, uh, when they told us their intention, uh, we found out very often it was not so. Uh, they would not tell us where they came from because they didn't want us to go there. Right. So we had to get the ability so a lot of what they said, we had to analyze and figure it out. Uh, that's what part of the Montauk Project was about, actually, is to, is to like a, a litmus test of uh, some of this information. Hi, Michael. You are live right now. Say hi to Stuart. Hi, Stuart. How are you doing this evening? Uh, hello. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I have a, just kind of a, a weird question, in it, and it ties a little bit into the biblical aspect when you went back and 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 saw jesus how did they prepare you for that for like not to catch diseases to get sick i mean going so far back when viruses were different did they just pump you up with a bunch of shots or how, how and i'll take the answer off the air but yeah. how do they prepare your body to mm. not come back with leprosy or something ah, well, great question thank yeah, you michael it's a very good question, and I will tell you, when we went through the, what I call the mirror, the, the, uh, the, the surface of the vortex to go through, that kind of purges the body, it changes the calibration of the body, um, and when you step out into the new environment, your body adapts to that automatically because your, your vibrational field is matching to that. But uh, the, the good point there is, human body is not really designed to do that. And that's why so many of us died or got very sick. And as I mentioned, I had Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, I was got blind. There's many side effects that were not pleasant from this uh, experience. Did anybody ever come back with any diseases? Not that I remember. I had never seen or heard of an incident where someone came back with a disease. 
That, you know, obviously we go to foreign countries, you know, you get inoculated for whatever. Um, and going back, there's there must have been some crazy chance of you, uh, just the common cold, you know, something from today that uh, we can fight off maybe would have really messed things up back then. What I recall as far as uh, that is concerned, the electromagnetic frequencies that you pass through basically killed anything in your body that, you know, even the good cells, it was kind of like a radiation. So I, I don't think any disease got through either way. What was, um, uh, what was your ability a- after all of this, uh, each event happened? Were you able to remember it the next day, or did these memories come back as you started to grow up? No, I remembered them consistently and, and, and contiguously. Did you think you were dreaming? Sometimes I did. Sometimes I wished I was. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not being facetious, but, you know, when you have these extraordinary events, you must have woken up in the next day and, and had to ask yourself, was this a dream or was this real? Well, I would have done that except for the uh, evidence. For example, uh, the sheets or the covers of my bed would be across the room. Sure. Uh, I would be uh, naked. I would have marks on my body. I'd be bleeding. I'd have scrapes. There would be evidence that it really happened. Were you, um, uh, this is just a funny question. Did you ever bring back anything, uh, a souvenir? Oh, you were never allowed to do that. You, you, yeah, but did you sneak something in your pocket? You were naked when you went in and out. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Um, so you couldn't even be tempted? Uh, well, they knew all the tricks, believe me. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah, that's the first, that's the way my mind works. You know, if I was out there, I would, uh, I would walk past something and sneak it in my pocket, but you couldn't do it. Well, if you ever came to my house, I'm checking you before you leave. <laughs> yeah. Are you coming out to California anytime soon? I have no plans. I used to work there. Um, but right now I don't have any plans. Are you speaking anywhere? Yes, a lot of places. You want to know where? Absolutely. Well, actually, uh, February, I'm going to Prague, Czech Republic, to make another movie about my uh, Jew World History book. Then I'm going to Wrocław, Poland, uh, to do a huge seminar and television show there. Then I'll be in Vienna doing a seminar. Oh, man. Then I'm making a quick stop in Moscow and Hong Kong, and then Taipei, where I'm doing another big seminar. And then I'll be in Seoul, South Korea, and then I come back. Let's grab one more call before we wrap up tonight. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Say hi to Stuart. Hey, Stuart. This is uh, Jeff here in Orlando, Florida. Hi, Jeff. Um, I have a question about um, the uh, the alien... Uh, disclosure um okay hey jeff uh turn down the radio in the background i can tell it's messing with your speech okay quickly quickly okay go ahead yeah hi Stuart. um i have a question about uh the alien disclosure um as you probably know um stephen bassett is in the process of trying to get the congressional hearings uh for for that purpose um do you feel at this time that all that you've been through and, and discussions with these uh, these alien species, is there ever going to be any possibility? Uh, does it make any sense uh, from their perspective or yours that uh, the government uh, will ever reveal anything um, to the masses based on what you're saying? Some of it is pretty frightening. Mm-hmm. Well, I, it's, a, it's a little bit of an answer for that because uh, we are in the process right now of seeing the staged alien invasion scenario being played out, which is why the government is saying there are these Earth-like planets out there and that there's you know, a possible contact here in your lifetime. They're preparing you for a, a, a staged invasion. So to answer your question, the truth, no. You're not ever going to know the truth the way it really is. You'll only know what the government wants you to know. There are many alien groups who want their presence to be known and have even threatened the government that if they don't tell them, we will. 
but uh, these have become uh, en- what they call enemy, enemy operatives, and the Air Force is even told to shoot on sight uh, when they see those particular craft. So it's quite a mess out there. Uh, but what you're seeing on the news now is the preparation or the, the beginnings of the staged alien invasion information. All right, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. You, you know, and he raises uh, a, a really good point, and that is when it comes to what we see in the mass media, and it seems like it's getting trickled down, not only from Hollywood and from uh, Washington, D.C., but the Vatican and, and the way that they're, you know, recognizing uh, the possibility of, uh, you know, alien life, that it, it is it's happening right in front of us. What is it that they're I'm not worried about E.T., but what is it that why, why would they care at this point? Isn't it to their advantage to just get this out of the way and moving forward? You mean the government? Yes. In order to do that, they would have to admit that they've lied for 60 years, and they're not going to do that. Well, it, you know, just like with your parents, eventually you got to admit to the lie when you wrecked the car when you were 15, you know, that kind of thing. Get it out of the way. It may not seem like a pleasant experience to go through, but, you know, you're going to have to do it sooner or later. Well, they don't feel that way because their analysis of the situation, and this goes back even to the 50s, uh, they decided that such a revelation would undermine the government, the economy, religion, right. every facet of civilization. Right. So they're not, they're not going to do it. Okay, one last call. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Say hi to Stuart Swerdlow. Hi, Stuart. This is Hello. Mark from Oregon. Um, this is kind of a tough question, and I know these kind of questions are hard to answer, Stuart. But um, you were tortured and beaten up badly, broken down, and you had your mind compartmentalized so that um, programming could be placed there. Of course it was. And, uh, I, and I wondered um, how you came to to really to break down that programming mm-hmm. and uh, to what, it, you know... A, do you feel like to to some extent there's still programming in there that you haven't discovered yet? Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and if someone says to you that they're totally deprogrammed, that's a red flag. You know, I admit I have a programming. However, I've been working on it for 25 years, and I think I have a, a, a good handle on my triggers and my functions, and I've merged a lot of it out and flushed it out. Uh, through my techniques, uh, but uh, when I was, uh, shall we say, a guest of the government in the early 90s, they actually deprogrammed me with their own methods then, because they wanted to see what the results would be on a person such as myself. And so I took those uh, protocols and I combined it with what I learned about hyperspace energy and connecting to the uh, God mind within. And I developed my own protocols, which are less uh, invasive or hostile, and allow people to do that for themselves instead of having anyone do it to you. Great question, Mark. Thank you so much. Okay, now, these are, these are two fun questions. We got all the serious stuff out of the way. Mm. Can we just have some fun now? A few things. Okay. <laughs> did, did they ever uh, uh, reveal any past uh, famous UFO incidents as being real and actual, such as as Roswell. Yeah, that was a real one. What did they say about that? Well, they said, well, I mean, the the, the official story, of course, you know, is a weather balloon, and that's that's not true. Right. Uh, And there were actually three vehicles, not one, uh, that crashed. And there were at least two living entities. The others had uh, been killed. And a lot of the technology from those vehicles or what we're using today in our kitchens and, and uh, appliances and, and, and all kinds of and computers came from there. So were the three craft from the same? Yes. Th- they were the same? For that, that particular crash. But but people also need to realize that was Roswell. There was also a crash in uh, Socorro, New Mexico. Right. One in Aztec. There was one in, in Mexico. 
There was one in 1952 in Svalbard uh, under Norwegian territory. There were crashes in the Soviet Union, the Germany. I mean, they happened all over. And, w- and what about uh, on the same vein, uh, like uh, <clears throat> uh, the nuclear uh, missile silos that are being monitored? Uh, is that us or them? No, that's uh, the aliens have been very upset about uh, nuclear testing on the Earth, and they have sabotaged it a lot. Has uh, again right along the same vein uh, since 1947. Uh, it seems that uh, we haven't had any nuclear exchanges uh, and uh, offensive use of weapons. Mm-hmm. Is that uh, direct ET influence? Uh, from what I know, uh, since the late 1950s until, I'd say, the 1990s, there have been three incidences where nuclear war has actually been stopped by alien intervention. Not because they cared about the deaths of millions of people, but because it affected them. Interesting. And it, it, seems, it seems obvious. You know, there's, there's, there's a reason why... Uh, we haven't used any nuclear weapons. I mean, it's just it's it's kind of obvious, and we were right on the brink so many times, in, including today. Yes, that's correct. Uh, now, have you had any experiences with uh, any government interference of of uh, of late? <laughs> Wait, let me stop laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I told you we're going to have some fun. Yeah, that was funny. Uh, yeah, that's like every day of my life. Share that with us. What what happens? Oh, well, let's see. Uh, the, the the phones will go dead while during a consultation. Uh, the uh, computers will go dead. Um, they'll be uh, missing mail. Uh, I, you can hear the tapping in on the phone lines. Uh, there are weird things going on in the house, light bulbs exploding, uh, cell phones uh, going out. I mean, you name it. Have you, it have you ever had a strange phone call? Oh, uh, are you kidding? I'm on one right, right, right now. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny because you warned me. I'll tell everybody right now. Stuart okay. warned me. He goes, he goes, Jimmy, I'm telling you right now, man, the show is probably going to get shut down. We're going to blow up your gear. I said, let's bring it, man. Uh, it, it happens every day, uh, every every show. We've been pretty, uh, we've been pretty, pretty free tonight of interference. It hasn't. Uh, nothing strange has happened tonight. It's the first show in a long time, actually. Um, but what about uh, surveillance uh, outside of your home? Have you? Uh, do you get tailed? You know, do you mm-hmm. have strange cars and? Yeah. Oh gosh, yes. Uh, cars uh, going up and down the un- unmarked vans. Uh, people slowing down, taking pictures while I'm outside. Um, and especially when I'm traveling, like I said, there's always KGB. Right. Um, and they don't hide who they are. It's like, you know, here we are, you know. Do you ever walk up to them with coffee, you know? Oh, they come to me and say, <laughs> you are having coffee with us at your break. That does happen. No kidding. Oh, yes. And, and what do you do? Do you, do you have coffee with them? Do you sit down and I talk? Say, I say, uh, for, this one happened in Singapore. I said, uh, well, I really would like to go shopping. We have table downstairs. You have coffee with us now. <laughs> no kidding. I swear. Yeah. And, 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 and what do you guys talk about, Stuart? Seriously. Oh, uh, what's going on in the world? They told me in 2000. I think it was 2005 or six. Who was the president going to be in 2008? And I didn't believe him, and it came true. What? Yes, that's another story, Jimmy. Oh, man, we've got to have you back. I've had such a great time tonight. Oh, I'm glad. I, I, you know, we, we barely scratched the surface, and I really wanted to get uh, a little more into the hollow earth. Um, mm-hmm. we ha- you know what? You want to hang for 10 minutes and, and talk about the hollow earth? Sure, really okay. quick. Okay. Um, what you, you know what? I'm going to open it up in a more uh, easy fashion. What is the hollow earth? Can I tell you about how planets are created? Yes, 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 yes. Yes. So in, in planets and solar systems like this, when molten material in the formation of the uh, solar system, molten material is ejected from the star or the sun, and as that molten material 
flings through space, it spins and starts to cool and goes into a global or a round shape. And as it does so, uh, the centrifugal force within the globe then starts to push the, the material to the sides and then that pops out through a north and south pole opening and then the cold of space hardens the inside of this opening and the outside mantle. So we have an outside mantle that's cooled and an inside mantle that's cooled and hardened. And in between the inner and outer mantle is this magma, which is now trapped between the hardened surfaces. Okay. And as the two roll around each other, creates the fractures and creates tectonic plates. But inside, there is, again, a little bit of molten material that stays spinning in the middle because of the force of the spin. Mm -hmm. And that becomes like an inner sun. But it's really not a sun. It's just molten material. And how many times does that happen with a planet? Can it happen more than once? Well, Mars is like that. The Earth is like that. Uh, Jupiter is not because it's gaseous, and so is Saturn. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Uranus and Neptune are like this as well. Any, so, any hard, hardened surface planet is usually like that. So how many stages of that are, are inside Earth? Uh, there's just one hollow area inside the Earth. Okay, there's, there's not two or three... Well, between, between the inner and outer mantles, there's this area, like I said, is filled with magma, but there's also uh, connections between the inner and outer mantles. So there's kind of a third layer in between. Yes. Uh, 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 what's the word I want to use? Uh, like floors in a building? Yeah, yeah. I would have to show you on it. Actually, if you go to... Uh, uh, my videos on this, you'll see it uh, shown on the video. So would there be, if you look at it like that, uh, is that, uh, is that their, man, I don't want to sound naive, uh, but is that their sun? Is, you know you know what I mean? Is that their source of energy and that's how they live? And, and with the molten material in the, yes. Yes. Yes, of course, yes. And, could they grow plants? Oh, yes. It's very tropical in there because it's always warm. And the same thing on Mars. Yes, same thing on Mars. And that's where most of the population went when the ice comet ripped the oceans and atmospheres off of Mars. Many of them went inside. How far, how far down do you have to go? Depending on the thickness of the uh, crust at that point, it can be anywhere from 6 miles to 150. 20 miles. And is this what happened with, again, I don't want to sound naive, but you're the guy. I need the answers. Is that what happened with, say, Lemuria and Atlantis? Yes, yes. It collapsed into the inner, inner mantle, yes. And took the population with them, or was there an well, opening? Well, some of them escaped into that uh, third in-between area, which created the legends of demons under the earth, or hell, that's where that came from. Interesting. Interesting. Where was Lemuria, by the way? It would have been, well, actually, you're standing on an edge of it right now. In Burbank? Yes. Uh, <laughs> any, west of the San Andreas fault line would have been part of Lemuria. And then all of the Pacific Ocean, including Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, Philippines, Taiwan, all those areas are the remnants or what's the left above the surface. Was there a string of islands with Lemuria, or is it just one spot? No, it was a, a series over actually thousands of years. Right. And uh, at the end, the Atlanteans had uh, equipment that uh, disturbed the geomagnetic force of the Earth and caused the upper crust to collapse in and sunk the continent. That's fascinating. But guess what? It's parts of it coming back up. Where? Hawaii, uh, off the coast of Australia. And quite honestly, it's not good news for California. We, do you, oh, you know what? We're going to get to another subject here in a second. I'm wondering if you know about it. Did you hear about the uh, island that just popped up? Uh, with the vol uh, with the volcano, yeah, to near Tonga. I think. Yes, yes, in yes. near Tonga. Ah, yeah, it's kind of, yeah, that's part of what's going on. Yeah, interesting. There are parts of the ocean floor off the coast of Australia that have been rising as much as twelve feet per day. 
Now, I didn't talk to you about this before, and I'm hoping you're going to go right where I need you to go right now. We uh, did a discovery. We were part of a discovery that uh, off of the Malibu coast, the Malibu underwater base. Yes. Did you read about that? Well, I know about it. Okay. Well, okay. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> what? Uh, what do you? What do you? When? When we first published the images, uh, what did you think you were seeing? Okay. That whole region, even under the Catalina Islands, there's a huge base there, yes? Yes. And the reason they have a base there is because the continental shelf at this location under California is kind of propped up by stilts or rock poles, for lack of a better term. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it's starting to collapse, and the government has actually evacuated that Malibu and Catalina base. And uh, the reason they're doing that is because something not good is coming to your area. Did, did it look, when you first saw it, <clears throat> did you have an aha moment? Uh, well, you know, nothing surprises me anymore. Right. I, I kind of knew it was there. Right. You know? Uh, you know, I don't know. I should have had a different reaction, maybe. <laughs> yeah, because it's with all of the uh, UFO activity that's been going on off of the California coast forever. You know, mm-hmm. it's been going mm-hmm. on forever. Mm-hmm. Um, and everybody has talked about many researchers have been looking for this underground base, undersea base around Catalina, Marina del Rey, Malibu forever. We couldn't find any evidence of anything. And finally, we find it, and and we you know publish as many images as we could, and did our depth analysis. But it certainly was validation and confirmation for so many researchers uh, over the years that uh, I think it's the first time where everybody has been able to go, okay, aha, all right, there it is, finally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what you know, and I guess that's what I'm throwing out. Was that the reaction that you had? No, I, I just can I explain. It's because I know the base is being abandoned, or it has been abandoned, so they don't care who sees it now. You know what I'm saying? Sure. What the, is it connected inland anywhere? Well, well, the biggest base in your area is in the Mojave, and it starts from the Central uh, Valley, and it goes all the way down into the Mojave, and then goes east towards Las Vegas and the Arizona border. And the government refers to, the, to that as a reptilian nest. It's one of the largest reptilian underground areas. Is it connected out to this uh, entrance? With tunnel, not with with tunnels. Yes, sure. Tube, tubes. We call it tubes, uh, but it's not part of that. Uh, it's a separate facility. Interesting. Is it connected? Does it go uh, up to Area Fifty One? Yes, of course. Yes. Yeah, of course it would make sense. Yeah. When you look at where the Malibu entrance is, and with the with the photography and the imaging that we have presented on mm-hmm. on the web, it, when you look directly northeast from the entrance of uh, the base, it goes straight over the Mojave Desert. Mm-hmm. It goes uh, through all of the naval installations that are there, the naval installations that are on the coast, and of course, in a nearly a direct straight line to Area Fifty One. And I just don't find that as being a coincidence. Nobody's no. going to sell that to me. All the underground areas are connected with a tube system. They're all, they're all connected. Does it get to the East Coast? Oh, it goes global. It's global. Does it get to Montauk? Oh yes. Yeah. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. I just had an amazing time. And again, we just scratched the surface. And uh, the invitation is open. And uh, when you're ready to come back, you just let us know. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, whenever you're ready for me, (laughs) let let me know. (laughs) Expansions.com is the website. Everybody head straight over there. And if you don't go to...